Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. This is the Wix Online Meeting 174, August 1st, rolling our way through the year. Uh, second time on Twitch. Hope you guys are having a uh, good time joining us live. We have a few more people in the lobby hanging out with us, uh, but Jacob's here as always, which is wonderful. Uh, as always, these meetings are recorded right now, so for those of you that aren't with us right here right now, those will end up on YouTube. Uh, that's not really new. It's just kind of the way it is. Uh, I'd say we're going to have a short meeting today, except that I think triage is going to be interesting uh, for us today. And we will uh, I know, probably just kind of uh, probably just need to get into it, right? Let's go. You ready to do this? And <laughs> Bob's yeah. like, yeah, let's go do this and get this done. Um, all right. Here we go. Go off to the web. Um, starting at the top, which is now sorted by ascending. Um, I don't know. It's working for me. I hope that doesn't mess you up still, Bob. Uh, this is an old bug that's come back um, from the dead. Nah, just from a long time ago, because somebody has said that they're actually interested in looking at it. Um, and then the whole discussion went off on creating our own MD5 or SHA implementation to avoid the MIPS thing, which we are not doing, because um, that just sounds a little bit crazy. Um, and I think we said last week, yeah, we said that Trier said we'd take it for weeks three as long as it's an opt-in kind of thing. And since then, hey, we got a, a pull request. So let's go bop over to pull request real quick to walk through it. Now, um, one of the things that surprised me um, was that we also ended up with uh, not just heat.exe updating, but the generate compile with object path task. Um, and he added a FIPS compliant uh, switch for that. The generate compile with OBJ path task is this hack that I don't know why we had to do it all, but it has to do with if you have uh, WXS files in subdirectories in your project, when we would build, we would end up building the um, file names to the same OBJ folder. So if you had foo.wxs and then uh, xwac foo.wxs, when we built the two foos would collide over top of each other, and obviously you'd only get one, and that would not be good. Uh, so this task essentially gives uh, hashed, hashed names to each of the OBJs. And why it was hashed, I don't remember. It was a long time ago this was done. But of course it used MD5 because, well, that's what we were using way back when, and we didn't need a ginormously long string. Um, and so this person was kind enough to do the whole FIPS compliance on even the generate compile with OB object file thing. But we don't need this because this isn't a backwards compatibility space. This is just the OBJ folder layout. So I don't. Um, no one would ever use. Well, I say that no one would ever use the generated name. Yeah, I mean it's, it's yeah, it's just generated. So I Directly. don't know. I mean, this this creates an item group, right, with the uh, generated name. So yeah, it it adds the metadata somewhere in here. It puts the metadata on the item. Yeah, sets the file metadata object path, and then the. Wix compiler gets that and says, oh, cool, I will output this OBJ to this file name. So you can have the two OBJ, two file names with the same file name but different paths out to the OBJ folder. It, uh, it's just like a source source semicolon target, right? Yeah, something like that. Okay. I it. it was a long time ago. Yeah. No, so, I, I, have, I remember it. Yeah. So uh, I, I think an easier solution would just be to just nuke the MD5 and just put the SHA-1 stuff in there because we don't need to maintain backwards compatibility here. I didn't realize we were, like, I wasn't expecting this in this pull request that we'd be getting the the uh, uh, the generate compile with object path. I think we can just fix that and get rid of MD5 completely from this code. And that minimizes our surface area that you have to set for all of this. Just handle it, basically, so that the build tasks don't fail on a FIPS machine outright. Does that make sense? Bob, Sean, you guys are right. Whatever. Sorry. Yes. No, makes perfect sense. Okay. I agree. No one's ever going to need yeah. the generated name. Yeah, so. 
So, all right, I will add that comment here. Uh, now, the rest of this, I think, is very common. It's just the usual, hey, look, we have a, a bool that gets backed because, well, that's the way we were doing it before because, well, that's what you had to do way back when when all this code was written. Um, there's a fifth switch, I think, is the thing that matches what's in the um, compiler. Um, we don't need these changes, to, at least some of these. No, this is we do need these changes because these are the harvest changes to the whips target, but we don't need this one to be it. Um, does it affect the good star? Uh, no, this will not affect good star, Eric. Um, this is will only affect the, I think, the GG switch in heat. Is So if you're using the GG switch and then you add the FIPS, then you're going to get completely different GUIDs, which, of course, why we have to make it a switch so that people that are adding GG don't suddenly get flipped into um, that. So I, th so we don't need this line, and we don't need all the stuff above for general codes. But everything else I, is, looks good. And then um, check whether we can continue with non-FIPS compliant algorithms. If not, fit, I see. So it's do this and then spit out an error message. So it's basically giving us a better error message um, if you're using MD5. Mm -hmm. If you're not, if you're not on a FIPS compliant OS or however you get into the situation that you need something that is FIPS compliant. Um, yeah, and then the rest is just shuttling all the options around until yeah, you finally get to the point where you're like, hey, generate identifier, and then don't always pass false. Yep, so I think that's generally fine. Looking at this error message, use FIPS argument. Did this this must have already existed. The use FIPS argument must have already existed. Heroes here. So, yeah, okay, great. That message. So, this is great. I think we should just go back and remove the generate compile with object path and just make that FIPS compliant by getting rid of MD5 and going to SHA-1 and then just skipping that completely. I didn't even know this was in the space, but that totally makes sense, because there's no point in us having FIPS problems in the MS build and in a place where backwards compatibility doesn't matter. Uh, this, so one minor concern about that, mm -hmm. this will increase the length of the command line that's passed to candle. True, we, I don't know that we've had any issues with that. Um, not candle. I know we had it with other tools, but not candle. No, yeah. no, no. But candle takes it in uh, for this stuff. For oh, MS Build, it takes file. it in. Yeah, that won't matter. Right. We've already got a response file for a candle. Yeah, we already okay. solved that problem. Yeah. Yay. Um, so, not an issue. So, I think we should. So, here, I think we should take this, just this saw thing, and simplify the generate identifier to just. Well, I think it's just this red line and turn it into this green line here and then not worry about the rest of it and just get into a better space. Um, and then the rest of the heat stuff looks pretty good to me. Agreed. All right. Moving on. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Uh, we're going to skip these two because one of these days I'll have a time to mentally... Uh, spend on them. Have we not talked about this Visual Studio Code extension? We're getting another request to write a Visual Studio Code extension, which would be fine, but someone should go design it and come up with everything that it means to be that. Yeah, I think Bob left during that. Oh, that, that's that's when I had my my internet failure. Oh yes. Okay. Did we just stop here then? Yeah. Ah, uh, thank you for remembering. Yes. Yep. Um, all right, so we talked about this and basically said we're not doing this again. All right, like, yeah, someone could do that. It's a huge feature. That'd be great. Someone should go design it, create a whip for it, all that good stuff. I'm glad other people watch the meetings, and then you can remind me, since I've obviously forgotten in the last two weeks what actually happened. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably, like, yeah, it's like, yeah, that's great if someone wants to go write this, but I don't think we should keep this feature around just because it's a huge feature. Someone needs to go design it. Okay. 
So we're going to close this and say, yes, but we're not going to keep this open as a reminder for something no, that not until someone, is way too big. Right. If someone wants to write the whip for it, that'd be great. We can bring it back at that point. I would love to do it. Oh, JavaScript. Never mind. <laughs> Um, I have two disk install, resolve source, prompt, compressed true, fail to extract files during the cabinet from the attached container. Okay. Uh, isn't that, isn't, uh, what is that called? Hard error mode? Isn't there something that, that, an app can set to prevent that. that yeah, UI? and I thought we set it in Burn. Like yeah, the SEM and, exception, I think it's SEM something. Yeah, I mean, and we're already doing the, the linker trick to uh, load the... Oh, so we do, we do the linker trick to load the... The, I think the act, actively touched pages mm -hmm. into the page file. Yes. Um, but that's not going to work as a source because we're passing around the file handle. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know who's prompting here into drive D. Like, this could even be the Windows installer. No, I think the, sorry, that's but, that was the the hard error mode thing. There, there I yeah. thought there was a way that we could control that um, so that the OS wouldn't pop that up. Yes, and I thought we said it. Yeah. Well, they say they're hooking into the resolve source, the prompt for the disk. So it sounds like they're doing it. Yeah, but I thought it was a process wide thing. So if they're in our process, they should get the same behavior. Um, I read that as they're making their own prompt. Oh, I didn't read it that way. I, I read it as the, because they, they say something about it only showing up on, um, yeah, the last comment. I don't know why we see the pop-up sometimes and other times it just errors. I. I for sure know we saw the pop-up when installing a Windows 7 32. So the error message I expect. And part of that is just arranging your chain based on um, based on having a multi-disk install. Yeah, I'm, I'm also curious, how do they get what prompt is the go hit a disk that would make that prompt? Well, caching, right? Yeah, but why? We don't. We don't go asking for things in other drives. Burn doesn't go looking around at other drives and poking at them. No, right? but it's looking. It's trying to find the original. Oh, they have file. a two disk install, so they're yeah, running from yeah. a disk. Got right. it. Prompt Again, for disk two. Disks. What yes. is this? Sorry. Twenty seventeen. Yeah, I know. It's just so like, wow, people still ship on CDs. Well, sure, or DVDs. Sure, that's fine. Um, wrong volume. Please insert this one volume in the drive D. Can't try it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they're going to have to debug into this some more and see if well, they can yeah. get a more stable repro. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, it'd be interesting to see if we're setting if we're doing the hard error mode thing correctly. Otherwise, I mean, the error is expected, right? It's, I think so. The, it's, it's looking for an attached container on the original bundle. Yeah. So, you know, and unless you want to create, you know, freak out your media so that you have a copy of the bundle, the original bundle XE on both. I mean, it's, although it kind of looks like they're doing I can't tell which things are compressed and which aren't. Yeah, I, I'm, it is possible we're doing something wrong here, but someone with a two-disc thing is going to have to debug into it. Yeah. 
So I'm, we can put it in four as someone that wants to dig into that. and They can go... They can, I, I just... The operating system is taking over some sort of thing, which means resolve source isn't even getting called in. right? Because they say if you hit con, from that prompt, if you hit continue with the wrong, the, not the disk that it asked for, then we just get an error message. So I'm, I'm not sure why the operating system is why the operating system is getting involved when we told it not to. So yeah, someone's gonna have to dig into that one with two disks. Hmm, fun. Uh four, I think. Uh yeah, this could be an unpleasant change. Yep. We have a votive bug that the Visual Studio guys open said, hey, project listeners and all that kind of stuff. So we can go ahead and put that in four, and if someone wants to go dig into Votive, they can totally do that. Probably leaking, it looks like leaking an event handler or something here. So that's all good. Following I think we you, couldn't get a better bug report from a Microsoft person. Yeah, like use our template? Um, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, file and use problem. I, I swear we've seen this before, this whole one letter A thing. But I don't remember. <laughs> I assume this is Wix there and BA. Hmm. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, this must be Wix standard BX or or their own, but it kind of, looks like they've trimmed the rest of the Chrome there. Oh, but with name app.exe. So this is like a um, well, this, this is, is a Unicode actually problem. app.exe. Yes. Right. That's uh, so. I actually that's the question I would ask is. Does the window title start with the letter A? I think it does. I, I swear I've seen this where the something yeah, yeah, getting no, lost I'm, between ANSI and Unicode. Right, right. It it null terminates because the UTF sixteen strip sure, the next byte is a zero. So. Yes. So yeah, someone needs to dig 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 into this. I thought we already had an issue tracking this or this just sounds so familiar, but I don't remember why. I don't remember seeing it in files in use. I remember we had a problem with uh, doing the same thing when, <sighs> in some scenarios, we truncated the name. Um, <sighs> in the version resource, mm. I don't remember for files in use, but I'll 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 take a look. I'll okay. see if I can find something. Well, I think the files in use and the Wix standard VA is. Pretty new, relatively. Yeah, it does feel pretty new too. Three nine or three ten. And that's yeah, well, three ten is pretty new. Yeah. Um. So this one's interesting. They're saying that if you have a redirect to Amazon, it doesn't work, but or it does. You get an access denied. Um. So yeah, they need to like look at the redirect. Maybe it really does return access denied, or it returns a. I mean, whatever when INET is asking for the file and then coming back, it's getting access denied for whatever reason. So, yeah. Need is it an actual redirect? Yeah, this is a... If you, if you follow this, it does redirect you to um, AWS. So, GitHub is backed by S3, probably, I think is what it is. Sorry, I, I'm I'm asking if it's an actual HTTP redirect. I believe it is. Okay. I took a quick look. I don't know if I want to... I don't know if I can bring all that up right now and try it. But I was pretty sure it was a redirect. Uh, copy link. And it works in the browser, right? And it is a 302 found. 
Okay. Now, I know that some people, that it works on AWS S3 for some people, because uh, we have customers at FireGiant that use Amazon as their location to download things, so I don't know why it's not working. Um, but is, Are those direct links or redirects? I'm sorry, what do you mean direct links or redirects? A direct link to you know, s3.amazonaws.com versus a redirect... No, it's a yeah, it's a the location GitHub production release assets some number dot s three Amazon AWS dot com and then a whole bunch of goo. Right, I'm sorry. I, the problem is very likely the redirect, right? Not Amazon. S three works. That we know. If you have right. a direct link to you know oh, an S three blob, right? Does it work there? That works. Yeah, that does work. We yeah. know that. Um, yeah. I don't know of people, I don't personally know people using redirects. Yeah, well, this will be pretty straightforward for some of the bug if they want to drop in. Just go look at the code where Burn asks for it, set a breakpoint, and then step through it and be like, oh, hey, look, yeah, it came back with this response in the header from Amazon, and Burn interpreted that as a access denied. Oh, you know what it might be? Mm. Um, one thing that it could be just off the top of my head, because I'm looking at what's different, um, Burn will do a head request to get the size of the file. Interesting. Um, so that it can resume should the file fail. Um, and for really, really large files, you can't ask for, like, you know, more than two gigabytes or something, if I remember correctly, um, to stream it. So we, we bring it down in chunks. And so we use the head request. So it's possible that this Amazon account has, the, uh, the AWS has disabled head requests. Oh, that's interesting. That would be one thing. Because that's the one thing I see different that, you know, in this case, the browser, if you just browse to it, just does a get. It doesn't do a head yeah. request. If so, that would be a tricky thing to change. Very tricky thing to change. So uh, burn doesn't fall back if if the head fails, the download fails. Yeah, it does not do a like. Oh, let's try it without a head. Let's try it just again. Mm -hmm. It does not do anything like that. Hmm. So that's one possibility that I just come up with off the top of my head of like, yeah, that's the only thing I could think of. Yeah. Um, but yeah, someone could look at that and see if it's the head request that fails. You could step through it and debug it. Um, probably a good thing to toss in four if anybody wants to dig it, debug into it in four X. It's kind of okay. weird, like, but I've seen people have really have we not had this problem off of GitHub releases before? Uh, that's a fine question. Oh, it's a remote payload. Maybe people don't do remote payloads very often. So if you put your stuff up on GitHub, of course it works. Because all of our stuff, we have burn bundles that are up there. So the trick is if you have a bundle, uh, a remote payload up there, that's where we do the head request. Yeah, that might be an issue. Yeah, that could be a very real thing. Could be a very real thing. All right. Now for the thing that the rest of the peanut gallery is here. Um, someone wants to improve COM+. Plus. Sounds like a terrible, terrible world to be in dealing with COM+, Plus, but hey, it's still out there. Um, and I need to, from this, I realize that I need to go update our web page that says, hey, you need to go sign the CLA, because that's now handled by the um, um, CLA bot. CLA bot. I was trying to come up with, what's his name? CLA bot. Uh, so the CLA bot handles that for us now. So I need to go on my backlog as the go fix documentation says, hey, you don't have to sign this beforehand. You just have to accept the CLA bot when it says, hey, your pull request is too big to just be accepted as is, and so on and so forth. Um, otherwise, I'm not deeply invested in COM plus. So someone wants to go make it work better. I'm not particularly, I don't have any particular issues with. Question is, would we take it in three? Is the one thing. 
I guess um, from the description, it would be an additional attribute that makes it opt in. So, yeah, I, I'd be fine with that. Mm-hmm. Um, Yeah, I'm I'm okay with it going into Wix three, um, as long as it's an opt in. Um, Likely a new element. Why a new element? The current one isn't good enough, or is it just completely different? Like, is the data completely different than what you had to use before? Will not work. Import so that at runtime we can call it complete. Like all the attributes and everything else are completely different. I see. So it's the difference between a, a Wix component install this thing and a Wix, uh, sorry, Wix com plus install this thing versus a Wix com plus import this thing. That's interesting. Takes a good. Oh yeah, okay. Takes a file versus a good. So yeah, and is it really a difference between install and import? Does that make sense? And da, 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 da. so I think. Probably, I, I don't. I don't care about com plus enough. Do we need a whip for all of this, or can we just put the element, the expected element syntax, in this issue and call that good? Um, yeah, I, I, I actually, you know what? Let, let's just go discuss this on Wix devs. Cause I know Eric's on Wix devs now, so I think let's just go. Uh, Eric, I think the answer to this is, all right, cool, let's see this. Send an email to Wix devs that says, hey, I think I need to add this new element for COM plus that looks like that. We'll discuss the element to make sure that it fits our, um, our you know, kind of what we expect the elements to look like. So, you know, it blends in. Um, probably not a big deal. And then once we get the shape of the element correct, I think the rest of it will kind of fall out from there. Um, yeah, and then we can point at the right place to update the COM plus documentation. Yeah, I was confused whether this is a new API or an old API. It's on the same COM object, so I hope it just that they didn't that Windows wouldn't break an object. All right. The docs say it requires Windows two thousand. Okay, then we're going to be fine. Leading yeah. edge. Uh, Eric, I, I I wouldn't go too far. I mean, well, proof of cost. Yeah, do what you need to do, but don't do too much. Uh, just send, uh, yes, if you have any questions, send them to Wix devs. That's the right thing to do. But I would send your proposed language changes sooner than later because there may be, possibly, input that we get from the shape of the element and the attributes that changes the way that you then change the CA code. Um, I don't know that that's the case, but we need to kind of just sit, hey, we're changing language, we're enhancing language. Let's kind of walk through what it looks like now, what this new thing has to look like, and then we'll go from there. Um, yeah, so I, I know that Eric had a problem. He reached out to me and said he had a problem joining the list. Um, people have joined the list. Uh, since Eric joined, so I don't exactly know what the problem that Eric was having getting into it. Um, if you have problems, uh, you can uh, ping us wherever you know wherever you find us and things like that. So if you've tried to add yourself to the Wix Des mailing list and you're still having problems, just you can send a mail to uh, me or whatever. Um, yeah, and sort it out. I know Eric tried to do the through that link that Bob just sent in the chat. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, I don't I don't know if like your corporate email was eating the the response email you have to do to say, hey, prove that this is a real email account um or something. I don't know. Um but if you get stuck, I can add you manually. Um Wix Devs is a very quiet mailing list. Um so it's sometimes hard to know that you're actually on it. Um, but yeah, so I know Eric's already on it, so let's go ahead and send that, uh, send whatever you're thinking, and then we will discuss it, go from there. I think that's it. We're at the bottom. Yes? Well, you got to hit rock bottom first. Ha, ha, ha. Um... All right, so uh, someone's been busy. <laughs> Heroes are like, yep, I'm done. Um, other things people want to talk about. Um, so Eric, yeah, the like I said, Wix Devs is a very quiet mailing list, and the archives are. I found are very slow to update. I, it's a frustration I have with the hoster that we have for the mailing list that they don't update nearly as regularly as you'd want, and sometimes I have to go poke them if it gets stuck. Um, but you should have gotten mail for... Uh, you might have been added after the meeting request was sent out. Anyway, send mail to the mailing list. That's one of the easiest things to do. It's like, all right, cool. And it should say, if it goes through, uh, if it bounces back to you, then you know you're not on the list. But I checked, and your name is the email address you sent me is on the list, and I don't know why we have these problems with some people. It's very frustrating. You should just <sighs> mailing list technology should just work. Um, anything else people want to talk about? Questions, comments, things going on. So I'm going to throw one thing out there. Um, that I'm definitely not committed to, but it's something that I'm kind of kicking around um, based on an update from Azure DevOps. Uh, for Wix 4, we currently heavily use AppVair and um, the way that it organizes its build system, uh, providing and each project getting its own build and then each build getting its own NuGet feed, uh, the way that all that ties together. We heavily use all that AppVair um, infrastructure, which is fine, but uh, Azure DevOps just added the ability for public projects to have um, public NuGet feeds, which means that we could merge all of our NuGet packages into and publish them as one feed out of the build system, which would simplify a lot of things. Um, um, if we, I like that. <laughs> yeah, if we if we did that, and then we also have we could consider the option of moving to Azure DevOps, which I'm becoming more uh, familiar with since we use a lot of Fire Giant. Um, and it is generally just, uh, it's just more powerful than um, AppVare is. Um, so I'm not committed to moving um, because there's a lot of work in getting things working on AppVare, and I expect there will be a block of work another block of work to move it to Azure DevOps, but um, I just want people to know that I'm kind of poking at it and looking at it, and if there's enough wins, then if we can get enough efficiencies for it, then maybe um, we'll look at, at doing that. But before that happens, we'll we'll talk about it here on Wix Devs or something like that. Say, so, yeah, look, uh, this will save it. And I don't know, you know, right now it's mostly Bob and I doing most of the work in Wix 4, um, but I do think it would simplify the life for people later um, working on it, so now you're still you're talking about just for CI, right? Git, GitHub still for source. Repo. Yes, yes, yes. No, the, the the Azure DevOps experience for source code for public source code is it's not it's, it's not, not what you want to do. No, it's it's just not. It's GitHub is that, and now that Microsoft owns both of them, um, it's I don't expect Azure DevOps to ever do the work to add all the things that it would need to do to be a public place um, with all the other things you expect out of it. So we're not going to move off of GitHub unless something happened to GitHub to make it not work really well. But again, that's Microsoft, so I'm not sure. I, mean, I guess if you're a conspiracy theorist, you might say, yeah, they purposely destroy GitHub so that you have to move to Azure DevOps. Um, I've seen no, <laughs> nothing to suggest that they're even thinking about doing that. 
Well, uh, that's one way to spend seven and a half billion. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm the moving the build and the um, NuGet feed to a single feed on Azure DevOps could have some wins, especially also since could have a, um, a dedicated VM for doing our builds, which means our build times could be faster, especially during the middle of the day, because you know we're not paying anything for AppVair, which is fine. Um, so we get throttled and tossed in some background queue with all these other kinds of things. It's been fine. I'm not complaining about anything they've done there, but if we want to have control over it, Azure DevOps gives us the ability to have our private agent and do all that kind of good stuff. Again, all things that we've done at FireGiant, so um, could maybe do that again for heat for um, Wix. One one interesting thing is I've looked at adding uh, Visual Studio 2019 support it, for the native SDK, mm. and if we're gonna you know make that change to Azure DevOps, I might wait if we're going to do it just to avoid doing the work twice. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, AppFair's image, they're just, they're, yeah. Having your own build image has some nice side effects. You're like, yeah, this is just my machine. I'll put your agent, or here's my it's a virtual machine. Put your agent on it. I put all the software on it. Just build on this machine, and it's good to go. And since we already have all the infrastructure in FireGiant, it's not like it's even that difficult to add for Wix. So... Um, anyway, I, I have not obviously I've not decided what I'm going to do there, but uh, if I have any more challenges or hiccups or anything like that, and moving to Azure DevOps is easy enough, I might just do that. There are also interesting things in Azure DevOps that I've not looked at. Just so you see, other things that I've seen that, uh, that make me think this way is Azure DevOps has the ability to um, cascade builds, where one build can end up triggering another build. Um, Oh, that could solve a lot of our <laughs> micro repo problems. Exactly. With the micro repo, sometimes we end up with where one thing needs to then trigger a whole bunch of other things downstream. Um, and so that Currently, could, it's by digital, by human digits. Correct. And so that could be very interesting if that worked out uh, well inside Azure DevOps for us as well. Um, anyway, little things. Just you know, we're spending a lot of time and energy on it might be a thing that we look at. So, um, correct, Eric. It is possible to have your own machine and put the Azure DevOps agent on it to do your builds. That's what we do um, in FireGiant because we've had some more uh, complex build requirements than are available in hosted build uh, scenarios. And so we're able to have like you know many versions of Visual Studio, like Visual Studio 2010, things like that. Being able to have your own build machine, put the agent on it, and hook it up to Azure DevOps, works very very well. And then you know that that machine is as fast as you choose to make it, so you're not dependent on the system, some hosted system spinning up a virtual machine, putting your stuff in it, doing that, and then tearing the whole thing down and all that. So you know your throughput is a little bit faster too. Um, anyway, you, you get control. You know, you pay the electric bill, but you get more control for it. Um, so, on the other hand, using the hosted build ensures that you're not taking advantage of something that's installed locally only. Uh, Meaning, you have to solve the problem of bringing in it, your build dependencies. Correct. You do. You do, and sometimes it's not worth the hassle. For example, the amount of things I had to do to get the strong name signing to work um, for Wix in Azure in in AppVair was annoying. Secrets and things like that that aren't just a string are really annoying to do up there. Where if you have a private host to build machine, then you can keep the secret local in like the security uh, certificate store, for example. Anyway, um, just things, 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 things. Yeah. Build process stuff that when you have a project that's, you know, uh, a third of a million lines of code and has code from a very long time ago, um, any of that. Uh, it, it, you just have build problems, uh, build process needs that you then have to solve. Uh, Jacob, on an unrelated note, did we opt for a stable time for the dev meetings or are we still pondering a mixed set of times? Uh, um, 
we this is the first one that we did at four. I didn't even mention that that this is started at four o'clock uh, because Sean is now down under. Um, how's the weather, Sean? It's great. It's great. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, we're trying this slot. Have we decided? I honestly, this was a little bit of an experiment to see if we could get Sean on and see who showed up and how all that worked out here. Um, I, I have a bunch of survey data that says. Uh, that is not definitive on what time people want the meetings. And in general, people were like, we're really glad you record the meetings. Um, and um, so we don't have to attend in person kind of thing. Um, I think this 4 o'clock time slot is very bad for Europe in general, which is not ideal. Um, or it's not, it's not very bad, it's not great. Uh, the 8 o'clock time that we talked about it, the 8 p.m. time that we talked about at one point is just, you know, the middle of the night for Europe, which isn't great. Uh, so um, I'm still kind of thinking that, you know, we'll see where we get with Sean. He's off, you know, going to go gallivanting on his walkabout. So there may be weeks that he's not available anyway. So we may get to a point where we do more of a uh, this week is at this time slot, this week it's at this time slot. So we kind of stagger our time slot so people that want to show up live can. I haven't committed to that, to be very clear, uh, mostly because I don't know that a lot of people will show up, which means that maybe we just need to keep it here for the set of people. Uh, for those of us that do show up regularly, we just pick a slot that works for us. Um, but wouldn't mind more people showing up. It's nice having uh, other people hanging out and live because we get more questions. feels a little bit more exciting um, as it goes by. Uh, so, I, like I said, I haven't decided completely. Um, most importantly, I'm glad that uh, the new Twitch thing seems to be working, that our recordings seem to be working, that we've sorted out the uh, duplicate Bob and Sean uh, tinniness problem. And now I think we nail the. Uh, if we could figure out how to nail the uh, um, time slots, that'll be uh, one of the next things to do in the media request. Bob has also said that we probably should do more of announcing when the meeting requests are um, earlier in advance. For example, on Twitter, which I think is a great idea. Um, so it's just getting to that. So it's not crazy amounts of overhead for me every time we send out a meeting. Um, and that's mostly me getting that process down and then automating as much as makes sense. So uh, the answer to the question in the end is, we, I, I'm not sure we're committed 100%. I like being able to explore a little bit. I'm actually, when you think about it, kind of tickled that Sean has moved down under and is still able to join us like always. You know, He's said as many words as he has said in any other meeting. Um, so, <laughs> so hey, we're all, we're doing great on that front. But we'll, we'll, um, we will experiment a little bit more, I expect, as we go forward. But let's not do the 8 p.m. in on the West Coast thing because you're still not up for the 11 p.m. It, it'd be like the old Wix nights where you know we started at Wix night at you know whatever, and everybody went home at two in the morning or whatever on Thursday nights. It's great. Yeah, except you know, you know how many Friday mornings were really late mornings for me. <laughs> uh, it was good. We were younger back then too. Um, and that was before kids. And a whole bunch of other yeah, things. That so. did help, yes. Yeah, like I said. So I'm I'm not sure what we'll do there. I, I think we may, honestly, where we may, if we want to, we'll, if people are going to show up, we, if we can get a set of people that want to show up, especially people from Europe that are like, like to show up but can't, then we may alternate between the, the 9.30 a.m. and the 4, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, meetings the, on the Pacific time kind of thing and see how that works for a while. Um, but I got no information that said that thurs that any day of the week was better than Thursday. So right now I'm inclined to keep it on Thursday since that seems to be, you know, it seems, seems like a good, you know, day of the week to kind of do things. Almost the end of the week, but not the end of the week kind of thing. I think 4 p.m. at on Fridays would probably not work out real well. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> um, although, what time is it for you, Sean? It's like Friday morning, right? Yeah, it's almost 8 a.m. on Friday morning. Yeah. So, I mean, it's already Friday for Sean, so we can't move it much past Thursday. I mean, uh, Saturday morning, yeah, that wouldn't be much fun. So, all right. Anything else people want to talk about? Stuff going on? No, no, going, going, going. All right. Well, 
you guys have a good one. We'll be back in, oh, I yeah, two weeks, right? No problem. Uh, 15th of August should be great. Uh, we'll do that. And uh, until then, you guys hang out. We'll have discussed something on Wix devs. I'll go take a look at that pull request since it's already been updated, which is pretty awesome. And uh, we will see you in uh, two weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.